So part four of the engine rebuild and I'm really excited about this part because this is when I finally get to put everything back together because the connecting rod bearings and also the main bearings have arrived so that means that I can start by putting the crankshaft and all the connecting rods and pistons back in the block so that's what I'm going to be doing for this video. The heads will still have to wait for another day but I'm, because I'm still waiting for the head gaskets but they should also be arriving pretty soon so hopefully from now it's not going to take that long putting this engine back together. But just to tell you some of the things that I have done to the crankshaft and to the block so the first thing is of honed the blocks just slightly. Um, the way you hone these LSL um, blocks is you just use a felt hone. I just lined a regular hone with some felt and then I lapped these using a special um, paste that you're supposed to use. And I didn't do the best of job on that I think because you can still see some texture in these um, cylinders. Well, what they say is what's supposed to happen in these LSL blocks is that if you do them properly, you're not supposed to be left with any lines at all. It's just supposed to be like a dull aluminum, but still it looks pretty good. At least I got rid of all the scratches and everything. And just to show you what I've done to the crank, I polished the crankshaft because if you remember from when I took this engine apart, like all these um, journals were actually pretty scratched up because of the spun bearings and everything. But just after a bit of um, polishing just by hand, um, the crankshaft has actually come out pretty well. Like it pretty much looks like you, you can't really see any deep scratches or anything on it so that's pretty good and I've also chamfered these oil passages that go to the that feed oil to the connecting rod bearings so here's where the connecting rod bearings go and they spin in this direction so I've actually directionally chamfered them so that it will help uh, flow more oil to the connecting rod bearings as it spins over these holes these holes were actually chamfered from the factory but they weren't directionally chamfered it was just a round chamfer so I've also um, directionally chamfered them in one place that's because the connecting rod bearings that's what uh, was wrong with this engine all the bearings were spun so hopefully chamfering these will give these bearings a better fighting chance for next time so now that all this is done the next step is to first measure the clearances inside the block so for the main bearings and for the rod bearings just to make sure that all the clearances are fine then I'm going to be installing all the new bolts and everything and then just um, putting everything back together but first before I do any of that I'm just going to blow air through the oil passages and just clear out everything because the block has been sitting for a while and I I just want to make sure that everything is clean before I start putting all this back in the block. So just to quickly explain how oil actually flows through this block and how to clean it. Well the oil pump actually goes somewhere over here on the engine and it flows all the oil to this gallery over here and from here the oil goes up from here to this passage and this passage actually lines up with the timing cover right over here and from here the oil goes to your oil filter housing it flows through your oil filter and back in through here. And then from this passage it actually leads to this over here which actually flows the oil back to your block. And then from your block over here it actually goes to two places. One the oil goes up from here into this head. And then from this head it actually gets drained down to these um, passages that are on the side of the engine. And then these passages flow the oil back to the oil pan. And the other place it goes in from here is it goes down and then it goes to this gallery. This is actually the main gallery that supplies oil to all your main bearings and to the um, oil squirters. This gallery is actually running the whole length of the block. You can see it over here. So if you so if you look at where the main bearings go, there's actually holes drilled over here that lead all the way up to this gallery. Um, so that's how your main bearings get oil pressure and then from your main bearings, this is where your main bearings go and there's actually a hole drilled from your um, where your connecting rod bearings go to your um, main bearings and that's how your um, connecting rod bearings get oil pressure. So the other place it goes from that gallery is there's also this gallery coming from the side and this gallery is what flows oil to this head and then from this head the oil gets drained down from these passages and the other place the oil pressure actually goes from on this head is there's also this tiny hole drilled over here and this tiny hole actually leads to this um, opening over here which also lines up with the timing cover and this is actually where your timing chain tensioner goes so oil pressure is actually fed to the timing chain tensioner over here because obviously the timing chain tensioner on this um, car also works with oil pressure so it uses oil pressure to open up and to finish any slack in your timing chain. Um, so yeah that's the last place the oil pressure flows to. This is basically all the oil system in the car. And what you need to make sure is that all these oil passages are clean from inside. I've already cleaned them once. Um, the way I cleaned them was I put gasoline inside them to dissolve all the old oil and everything and I also cleaned it with a wire brush. So like. I inserted a, w a long wire through this with a brush at the end and I cleaned up all these passages. But for now what I'm going to be doing is, because all the oil galleries are already clean, just as a final thing I'm just going to be blowing air through all these oil galleries. So I'm just going to be like blowing air pressure through all this just to get any dirt or anything that's stuck in there just to get it out of there before I 
start putting everything back together because if any dirt or something is in there it's obviously going to go in the bearings or in the hydraulic lifter or something else and it's going to cause problems later on. So now that the block is all clean the next thing I have to work out is figure out where the colors actually go for all these bearings because if you remember from the end of part one I just slightly talked about um, these colors that are printed on the end of the crankshaft that refer to um, colors of these bearings. So the, the colors are actually this um, anodizing or like paint or whatever it is on the end of these bearings and it actually refers to a certain thickness so the yellow bearing would be a certain thickness and the red bearing would be a certain thickness and for the clearances to match perfectly you have to put these in this sequence over here so the G R G R R G refers to yellow it's in German and there's actually a document that actually tells you all this um, this document um, this can be found in the service manual just to tell you the title of this one I think this is the document number and the title is install gauge crankshaft bearings um, and this actually has all the instructions on how to um, get these clearances right. So just to quickly tell you how to get these clearances right, well the G refers to yellow and 54 is the part number. These are, these are the last two digits of the part number. When you'll need to order these, you'll need to order these as, so like the last two digits of this part number is 54 and the last two digits of this part number is 56. 56 is for the red. So R is red and the last two digits are 56. So basically these two bearings will be of slightly different thicknesses and they need to be on um, the parts they're actually designated to be on for all the clearances to match perfectly. These letters actually refer to just the um, bottom half of the bearing. The bottom half of the bearing is this one. This is the lower half of the bearing. This is the upper half of the bearing. The upper half of the bearing is the thing that goes on the block. So over there. And the lower half of the bearing is what goes on the end cap. And all these end caps are numbered too, so like from 1 to 5, and you need to put these in order. So 1 needs to go like all the way on the front of the engine, then 2 needs to go there, 3 needs to go there, and then so on. And then um, like this letter, the G is for the first one. So for the first um, end cap over here, um, the color of the bearing that goes in this end cap is actually green. Oh, sorry, G stands for yellow. So it's actually yellow, so that means I'll put this bearing um, over here in number 1. And then the second one is red, so that means that I'll put this bearing over here on the two. Um, and for the other half, for the lower halves that go in the block, there's actually numbers printed on the block. So you can see this two printed over here, there's two printed over here, and then all of these are two for mine, but they might be different for yours. So that actually refers to which bearing goes inside here, like on the block side. So the block side and the cap side are actually different. And the problem is that when you actually order these bearings, they actually come in sets. So when you order the red one, it actually comes with two red bearings. It doesn't come, like you can't order these separately. So what you have to end up doing is you have to end up ordering extra sets to actually like complete your set because you might need like for this one, I need a, r a red on the top and the yellow at the bottom. So to actually complete the set, I'll need to order one red and one yellow. Uh, one set of reds and one set of yellows just because I need one red on the top. Um, so that's really like a bit of a problem ordering these. You'll need to order extra sets and you'll need to spend a bit of extra money on it. Um, but yeah, hopefully, I hope that makes sense. That's how you uh, match these colors and these colors have to match up perfectly for the clearances to match. So now I have all the bearings installed on their proper locations and next I have to do the job of measuring the clearances. Now for this part I did cheap out a little because I'm just going to be using plastic gauge. Um, the reason is I did try to find someone to let me borrow his uh, micrometer for like measuring all, all the clearances and everything because that's the proper way. But I guess no one really trusts me with their expensive equipment. Um, that's why I'm just going to stick to plastic gauge for now. And if the clearances do seem off then I might go through the extra um, process of going to a machine shop and getting these clearances measured properly but for now I'm pretty confident that the clearances should be fine because the wear on the crankshaft didn't look too bad and also the wear inside the connecting rods it's not too bad um, just to tell you what plastic gauge is and how it works it's basically a cheap alternative of doing the proper thing well the proper thing is actually to uh, measure the bore inside here with the micrometer and then actually measure the diameter of the journal on the crankshaft and then subtract those two values to find out how much clearance you have in between the crankshaft and the bearings uh, the cheap alternative of that is plastic gauge. Plastic gauge is just this um, thin plastic strip that's in here. You uh, you put that thin plastic strip on the crankshaft and um, what happens is that this plastic gets crushed between the bearing and the crankshaft and depending on how much it gets crushed it actually gives you an indication of how much the clearance is um, how much the clearance is between the crankshaft and the end cap and that's what basically tells you whether your clearances are too high or too low um, so if that's within a safe range then I won't go through the extra step of um, getting these clearances measured properly um, but if those clearances look too big if they're like right at the margin then I'll probably um, go through the extra step of maybe oversizing the bearings and um, getting the clearances measured properly but let's hope that doesn't happen I've taken all the end caps off now and now you can see that that plastic strip that was in there now it's crushed to this um, line that's over here 
and um, yeah that's what it looks like for all of them and the plastic gauge actually comes with this little gauge over here so you compare the thickness of this um, to like um, how thick it is on this gauge and that actually tells you a value in millimeters so just to check that on this one um, you can see that's like right around um, 0 0.025 and the second one is actually like slightly larger it's actually um, 0 0.038 um, and then this one is again 0 0.038 and that one well, that's a little hard to reach but that was within that was in between these two values I already checked that once and this one is also 0 0.038 um, so these are actually pretty surprising numbers for this engine because these are right within the factory specifications because um, this is the document now I'm not sure how accurate this plastic gauge method is so it could be that um, this method is off by like um, like a few um, numbers but um, anyways this is a factory specification like this specifies that the clearances should be between um, 0 0.030 millimeters to 0 0.052 millimeters so yeah, after measuring these values I think it's safe to say that the engine is fine and I'm gonna be putting it back together and it's there's probably no need to um, go through the extra step of going to a machine shop and measuring the clearances properly and definitely no need for oversized bearings I think oversized bearings in this case would probably put the clearances below the factory specifications so the clearances might be too small after that um, so yeah that's actually pretty surprising to see on an engine with such high mileage and again I don't know how accurate the plastic gauge method is but still if these values are accurate like that's pretty surprising to see how good the clearances are inside this engine after this I just got to putting the wrist pins back in the pistons and the connecting rods and for this just make sure that the wrist pins just slide easily into the pistons I put some oil on them before I put them in the pistons and then you have to put these retainer clips back on these are a little tricky the way I like to do them is that I try to force them in as much as I can by hand and for the rest of them I just use a screwdriver and I just push it into place and that method usually works pretty well so just to tell you what I'm going to be doing for putting this engine back together, I'm going to start off by installing these oil uh, squirters back in the block. And then after that I'm going to be installing the crankshaft. The bearings are already in place and the fasteners, I've already prepared all the fasteners. Um, because the old fasteners are still in here, I did measure the length of the old and new fasteners. They have stretched by like about a millimeter. Um, the new fasteners I've already put assembly loop on them. So talking about these fasteners, there's one thing I regret doing um, and that's going with ERP hardware. I think that would have been a good, this would have been a good time to move to ERP studs and bolts because ERP studs and bolts are actually good for multiple uses whereas these bolts are just good for one use so like you can only install them once and they'll actually stretch after that use and the next time you have to take your engine apart you'll need to buy all these bolts again and they actually end up being pretty expensive because each one of these bolts I think it's like 20 or 30 dollars or something but when you add it up for the entire engine you end up spending like over a thousand dollars um, just for fasteners and ERP hardware is expensive too I think that will also easily cost above a thousand dollars for this engine but at least it's good for multiple uses so that whenever you take this engine apart again you won't need to replace all the bolts again next time so I started off by putting in the oil squirters and just to tell you a bit more about these oil squirters or oil sprayers, they're primarily there for the cooling of the pistons, so they spray oil on the pistons and it's actually not just a simple pipe that just um, throws oil, it does have a small valve in it, um, so it's supposed to close and like it's supposed to not flow any oil when the car is idling and when the oil pressure builds up, like when it builds up above 50 psi or something, then um, the valve actually opens up and then these um, oil squirters start um, spraying oil on the pistons and you can actually test these to make sure they're working so if you uh, blow air below 50 psi in these oil squirters nothing should come out and then if you blow air um, above 50 psi so when your air pressure is above 50 psi um, these oil squirters should open up and they should let all the air through um, because that's how they're designed to work they usually never fail so it's not that important to test them but um, if you want to test them that's how you uh, make sure that they're working properly after the oil squirters were installed, my main bearings were already in place, but I still had to install these thrust bearings, so that's what I did next. I just um, uh, stick them in place using some assembly loop, that's the easiest way I find. And once these were in place, I just lowered the crankshaft into position. I wasn't using assembly loop on the main bearings, I just used oil because that's what the service manual tells you to do. After the crank was in place, I just um, installed the end caps, and um, for end cap number 4, just remember to put the two thrust bearings in place. After everything was in place it was time to torque everything down and the torque procedure I was following was um, this procedure, it's found in the service manual and you basically just start from the inside and work your way to the outside bolts and there is also stages to torquing these bolts, so the M10 ones, these are the ones that go closest to the bearings they have to be tightened in three stages, so 5 newton meters, 30 newton meters and then 
90 degrees. The final 90 degrees is to stretch the bolt and the M8 bolt that goes on the side that just has one stage you torque it to 30 newton meters. You do that on the final stage so like when you're at stage 3 you're giving the bolts 90 degrees. Um, that's the time on which you also um, tighten the M8 bolts on the side. After turning the bolts 90 degrees I like to uh, mark these bolts with a marker just to make sure that I know which bolts I have already turned 90 degrees because if in case I happen to twist the same bolt 90 degrees again obviously that wouldn't end too well so that's why I just like marking as I go along. After the crankshaft is installed and all the fasteners are tightened to their proper specification just make sure that uh, you can still turn the crankshaft freely and you should be able to turn it pretty easily. And um, the other thing to check is uh, for these bearings over here, the thrust bearings, you should be checking the clearance for that. Now the proper method that the service manual says you should use is put a micrometer over here and then move the crankshaft to check how much um, axial play the crankshaft has. But the easier way to measure it is just using feeler gauges. So just um, stick a feeler gauge between the um, bearing and the crankshaft and you'll be able to see how much um, clearance that has. So the biggest feeler gauge I can put in there is actually 0.1. Uh, point uh, yeah 0 0.102 millimeters and that's also within the specification because um, the specification is from 0 0.10 to 0 0.266 so that's actually on the lower side of the specification so that's also really good now next I can finally get to installing the pistons and the connecting rods back in the block for putting these pistons back in the engine what I've done is I've just um, clocked these piston ring end gaps so one gap is on this side the other gap is on this side and then um, on the oil ring the two gaps are in different sides. The idea is just to make it a little harder for the air to escape through the piston down in your crankcase. Um, and next I've also added these rubbers on the bolt so if in case it hits the crank it doesn't nick the journal on the crankshaft that's the idea of putting these rubbers. After that I just put some oil on the piston and then I just slowly lowered it into the block and after that I just used my piston ring compressor to compress the piston rings and then I had to slightly just tap the piston with a hammer to actually clear the piston ring compressor and actually lower it in the block. And then I flipped the engine over and then all I had to do was line the connecting rod up with the crankshaft and once that was done all I had to do was put the end cap back on and put the fasteners in. I just tightened these fasteners by hand for now, I just left the torquing for later because even these ones have to be torqued in stages. Now all the connecting rods and pistons are installed in the block and the last thing I have to do is I have to torque these connecting rod bolts down. And these are also torqued in three stages, so the stages are 5, 25 and then 90 degrees. So yeah, I started off by torquing the bolts to 5 newton meters. And then after that I torqued them to 25 newton meters, which was the second stage. For the final 90 degrees this time I didn't go with the dial gauge, I just um, did this by hand. And the service manual says both ways are fine. As far as you don't use a bar that has any flex in it, so you don't get, so you don't accidentally get the angle wrong. And after you give it that 90 degrees, just mark the bolts so you know you have torqued them. After the bolts have been torqued down, just make sure that the crankshaft is still turning freely and also try moving the connecting rod side to side and just make sure that it's moving freely. So now everything is tightened down and I have to say everything is looking pretty good so far. Everything spins really freely and also I'm really happy with the clearances because they all look pretty good. Uh, by the way, I did put an old connecting rod bearing back in the engine just to see what type of uh, values I get on these old spun connecting rod bearings. And I did get a larger value so these bearings definitely had worn down and also I'm um, looking at the way the strip got worn like it was thicker from some places and it was thinner from some other places and the value was somewhere between 0.7 to 0.5 depending on where you actually measured it. Um, so yeah the bearings definitely had opened up and they were definitely closer to the upper limit on the range that these connecting rod bearings can have. But the good thing is that I think most of the wear was taken by the bearings and even though the connecting rods and the crank looked like they had been worn and they had been scratched up I think the damage on the crankshaft and the connecting rods was pretty superficial and most of the wear was actually taken by the rod bearings. And talking a bit about why it's so important to maintain these um, proper clearances in the engine. Well the reason is that there's supposed to be a thin film of oil between the crankshaft and this bearing over here. Um, if there's no film of oil then this crankshaft will start scratching up against this bearing and it will pretty much wear this bearing out in no time at all. So the important thing about maintaining a proper clearance is so that the proper amount of oil can actually flow in between the crankshaft and the bearing. If the clearances are too small then the oil wouldn't really be able to flow between the bearing and the crankshaft and if the clearances are too big then oil pressure wouldn't really build up between the 
um, crankshaft and the bearing. So basically the oil might flow out from like one side of the uh, bearing and the other side might not be getting any oil at all. So that's why it's really important to maintain these proper, proper clearances. So that's everything for this video. Really happy with how everything is going with the engine so far. Let's hope that everything goes well for the next few parts too when I install the timing cover and the heads and um, all the other stuff that needs to go on this engine. So yeah, definitely stay tuned for the next few parts. Um, thanks a lot for watching and hopefully see you guys in the next video.